Good day and welcome back to True Footy. Once again, it's me, Bush. I'm here to talk a bit more fantasy. Specifically today, I plan on going through my recent 10-team fantasy draft, sort of rationaling my picks, pick by pick, talking about how I built my team sort of thing. And I'm also going to run through my classic team, getting ready for round one. As I briefly mentioned in my introduction video, my main sort of strategy for fantasy draft is sort of predicated on finding the most value in relation to the players available in each position. The way I kind of figured out how to do this was sort of looking at the top 30 defenders and forwards because there's 10 teams, 3 starting forwards and defenders in my league, so that means on average everyone should have 3 top 30 defenders and forwards, assuming everything goes to plan. And considering we start four mids and one ruck, I looked at the top 40 midfielders for the same rationale because there'll be four starting midfielders between 10 teams and top 10 rucks because there's only going to be one starting ruck per team. I calculated the average of each of these figures that I've mentioned as the following. Midfielders were sitting about an average of 100 in our leg, the average starting midfielder. The average starting ruck was starting at about a 92. Defenders were sitting at about 89 and forwards were all the way down at 80. These figures were a good guide to sort of know what that average is but it's not the only factor to consider when going into the draft. So after that I sort of looked at the pools of each position and determined how many players were above and below average and how above and below average they were to sort of figure out the scarcity of each position. Basically, these scarcity calculations led me to determine that the forward was the most sort of scarce position for finding that top sort of quality and anecdotally as well, experiencing that in last year's league, especially because I didn't prioritise the forward position until it was far too late. I was left scrambling and had to be creative in sourcing talent in that position. So based on all those reasons, I sort of came to the conclusion that I needed to prioritise my forwards early in the draft. Especially because I knew if I was getting a more consistent forward, I wouldn't be dealing with as much variance as I would be with some of the more speculative key forwards, that sort of thing. I also, this year, did the sort of more casual exercise when I was just sort of half thinking about my fantasy team without sort of properly sitting in front of my computer with my spreadsheets and able to research stuff. I was just sort of on my phone with the app. I'd sort of just fiddle with my auto draft order a bit, just sort of based on what I'd known I'd worked on. Just sort of to have a rough idea which pr players I preferred over whom sort of thing. It was just a good little exercise to keep my mind thinking and adaptable for when the actual draft came. As I alluded to before, one sort of statistic that other than the how above or below average for their starting position the player was, another statistic that I valued was their variance, which was basically the difference between their highest scoring game and their lowest scoring game. I was sort of looking for players who sort of had a bit more consistency between their best and their worst. So I knew I wouldn't be caught in positions where if I had several players have shit weeks, that it wouldn't be my week, basically. Whereas if I have more consistent guys, I have a bigger floor to build off and I'm relying less on boom or bust guys booming in any given week. Going into the draft, I ultimately decided to favour forwards, as I've made pretty obvious at several other stages of this video. Basically because of that drop-off after the first handful. So basically I was picking at pick 7 and my intention was if any premium forward fell to me at 7, I was going to swoop. My strategy even involved this being the case, even if it was a more borderline premium forward like a Dylan Moore or an Isaac Haney, I was still going to take them if they were the best available forward. I was also contemplating going for the more unproven forwards with that sort of mid-level level of production like your Zach Butters or your Errol Goldens. Ultimately out of those four forwards I think I would have gone with Dylan Moore just sort of because he's got the highest baseline that he proved last year. I think he's going to be a point of priority for the Hawks considering he's in their leadership group and just feels like this even though Heaney does have the most consistency so that's a bit of a curveball I still think I would have ultimately gone with Dylan Moore at pick seven. As you can see, my league had a similar logic and four out of the six picks before mine were in fact forwards. I was expecting a few forwards to go. I kind of expected this scenario to happen. I was sort of hoping maybe a Rosie or a Cogs would fall to me at seven, but I did have a suspicion that this position would happen where I sort of 
would have the choice between a Dylan Moore or Isaac Haney type forward or something else. I did have one exception to the plan to take a forward of my first pick, and that exception was if Sam Doherty was still on the board. Based on that above-below average for their starting position logic, Sam Doherty was the second best performing player in fantasy last year behind Josh Dunkley. He basically averaged approximately 20 above average, above the average starting defender. So that much value in a position that's almost as scarce as the forward line, even though the forwards are more scarce, I think, than the mids, uh, defenders, sorry. There is still a degree of scarcity in the defender position that makes such a point of difference like Sam Doherty so valuable. So with that in mind, he was my exception to the forward rule. So I took Sam Doherty with my first pick, especially because I had a feeling one of those four forwards I talked about before would still be available at my next pick at 14, and I'd still be getting my hands on a top handful sort of forward. Now, as you can see in the second round, that I had the choice of all four of those forwards that I talked about before. So based on what I mentioned before, I pounced on Dylan Moore, for the above logic plus I was and at this point I was also hoping another person in that group of three that was left out of Haney, Butters and Golden would be available for me at pick 27 as well. I was starting to get optimistic for that so I was more than happy to take Dylan Moore for the what I feel is a safer floor than all of them bar possibly Haney. My hopes grew considerably throughout the rest of the second round as everyone else sort of started priority prioritizing those premium defenders, rucks and mids just sort of trying to maximise their scoring output at a given position, especially considering a lot of guys took forwards in the first round and probably needed to balance that out. However, at the turn of the draft is where things got a little interesting again. Interestingly, the person picking in this position was Joycey, an old friend of the channel. With his first pick at number one, he took Josh Dunkley to no one's surprise. For all the reasons I've alluded to, Josh Dunkley probably was the clear number one pick this year. But then when Joycey was picking next at picks 20 and 21, he threw a bit of a curveball. He went Golden and Zach Butters back-to-back, -back, basically picking all three of his forwards with his first three picks. Obviously, based on all the logic I've sort of gone through the last few minutes talking about why the forward position is the one to prioritise and how it falls off a cliff, so sort of based on this logic, you can understand me respecting Joycey going for this strategy. I was a big fan of it, despite the fact that sort of bit what I wanted to do in the arse a bit. I also like the fact that he took Butters and Golden because he took both the more speculative guys with the, probably the higher upside than Haney. And if you're taking both of them, on the balance of probabilities, at least one of those two guys is going to elevate and grow to that next level. So he'll have Dunkley as well as another one of those top handful of forwards. And even a third forward, even if they sustain or fall off a little bit from previous years, they're still going to be a top... 15 forward. I didn't however expect Joycey to actually do this considering Dunkley pick one sort of gives him that much of a clear edge in the forward. He could have got away with being more speculative and taking guys later and sort of hopefully loading up on some other positions where he might need. Considering Joycey's such a balanced man I thought this is what he did but he surprised me by taking two forwards and it's a pretty good move I'd have to say overall I think. As you can see in the third round, everyone sort of seemed to be prioritising maximising a player's scoring output, going for the 100 plus sort of players, sort of trying to secure as many guys in that 100 plus club as they could. So I was quite elated to see Isaac Haney did in fact fall to my pick 27, and I jumped on him quick as shit. Especially because he was the number 3 contender for my pick 7. The fact I got him 20 picks later... I just had to swoop. Unfortunately, at pick 34, I was faced with quite the dilemma where I sort of had a couple of players that I was choosing between in Brad Crouch and Sam Walsh. Barring injury, Sam Walsh would have been my man quick as easy. He was arguably the most consistent 100 plus mid in the league in terms of his consistency in scoring, which, as I've alluded to, is something I prioritise. So if it wasn't for the fact he'd be unavailable for the first few weeks of the season, I would have swooped on Sam Walsh over Brad Crouch in a heartbeat. However, I am also a fan of Brad Crouch and his potential output, especially under the new coach, Ross the Boss. He loves those sort of no-nonsense, go-get-the-ball type of guys, so I think Brad Crouch will have plenty of opportunities to be a possession pig and sustain, if not even build upon his production last season. So ultimately, for the fact that I was going to have him for the extra four weeks of the season, plus his upside's probably a little higher than Walsh's, even though his consistency 
is not nearly as consistent. I elected to go with Brad Crouch. It is also important to note here that I didn't actually have a defender on my team yet, so I did need a good M1 that was going to be performing for me from round one onwards. And if I was taking Sam Walsh in this position, my best midfielder wouldn't have been in my team for four weeks, so that would have hurt me a bit more than if I'd taken a midfielder early and felt I was in a position to hide Walsh on my bench for a few weeks. As you can see on the next turn, Joycey consolidated his lineup with a couple of defenders back to back, and then everyone just sort of started taking the last of the 100 plus guys that they could get their hands on. At this point of the draft, I saw the ruck position. I felt I would have the choice of sort of those above average, below premium sort of rucks like your Riley O'Briens, your Jared Witzes, those Rowan Marshalls, those sort of guys. And at this point of the draft, I decided to swoop on my main man that I've raved about in pretty much every draft video that I've made so far this year in Jared Witz. As you saw in my last video, I took him last year as well, and my logic was basically the exact same this year, considering he's the most consistent ruck in this position, even though his average last year was a point or so below the average starting ruck. The fact there's that much less variance in his potential best and worst makes me feel like that's a safe pillar for me to sort of build my team up and sort of be able to take the opportunity with more speculative guys because I knew Jared Witts would provide me a good consistent floor and not be a guy that's scoring incredibly low one week and putting me on the back foot. I do also admit that his upside is vastly limited compared to a Riley O'Brien, Sean Darcy, Ron Marshall type of player because those guys, when they have their big games, are in the 130s, sometimes the 140s, that sort of thing, whereas a big game from Jared Witts is probably... 120-ish and they don't happen too often is usually just pretty consistent around that 80 to 100 range with my next pick I went for Noah Anderson because I felt like my midfield was sort of less exceptional than my back line at this stage considering Sam Doherty is probably the clear number one defender this year whereas there's a few more question marks around Brad Crouch so I felt like I needed to invest in reinforcing my midfield now with this pick rather than reinforcing my back line so I went with Noah Anderson, who I think can at least sustain, if not improve upon his production last year in a growing Gold Coast team. Now, in order to keep this video from getting too monotonous, I'm sort of going to break the draft down by each bend in the draft rather than trying to be a bit round by round. I'm sort of going to go for it a bit more generally, 20-ish, couple of rounds at a time type of picks sort of arrangement. There I go with the bloody sword ofs again. Now that I'm mindful of it, hopefully I haven't done it a bunch in the beginning of the video and I can keep it in mind and not say sort of a bunch of times in the rest of this one. In this next bend of picks, there was a lot of defenders and midfielders being taken by everyone in the group. And me, I was no exception. I took one of each. My first pick being Liam Duggan, who I think, even though he's averaging a bit below some of the available defenders at this stage, I think he has more upside in an Eagles team that's going to start prioritising him more as someone I think they see as a future leader, even though he's not currently in their leadership group. In the back half of last season, when they were a bit more healthy as well, you saw a bit of uptick in his scoring. I think he's going to be someone given plenty of opportunities to score. Interestingly, in this spend, my other pick was an old friend of mine. Ollie Wines, my top draft pick from last year who bit me in the ass. However, in this instance, I'm not picking him at pick 10. I'm picking him at pick 74 as my third midfielder. And I think as a third midfielder, even if he falls off a little further than his fall off from the year before to last year, even though I think he's more likely to just sustain his current level of output, as an M3, I'm ecstatic to have that in my lineup. However, as my M1 last year, I would repeatedly cringe seeing some of his scores throughout the year at this turn of the draft it sort of turned into a lot of guys targeting what they seem to feel was the best available with forwards also coming back on the menu with the guys in that lower tier and that six or seven that have gone to this point but were the clear standouts of the position so we're now in that next tier of more speculative guys upside the key forwards your isaac smiths who rolls fluctuate year to year those sort of guys I, however, chose to round out my back line first. Although I had Doc and Duggan, who I both feel are very solid players, I felt like I needed another just rock-solid defender in case of injuries. And I think with those two being what I think will be consistent, I could take a bit of an upside gamble at the defender position as well at this point. 
So at this point, I chose to take Mason Redman, who I think he's posted some absolute monster scores when he's given the opportunity to play the role he likes. However, other games, he gets regressed to a bit of a lower score. So I'm sort of gambling on him getting more games playing that preferred role in his case where he racks up those regular 120 plus sort of games and I can afford to ride the roller coaster a bit more with Doherty and Duggan supporting him in the defender position if this pick pans out I could very well have close to the best back line in our league my other pick in the bend was finishing out my starting forwards and I chose to go with Jeremy Cameron who I believe is definitely the best pick of all the available key forwards and, I've, and although I often say that the key forwards are roller coasterish, I think Jeremy Cameron sort of balances that out a little more because he's probably the one, a top one or two sort of key forwards that's good at racking up a few of those extra sort of posies that beef their score up a little bit, even if they're not getting the mark, set, shot, goal combos that just build up those 12 points at a time sort of thing. It was in this next bend where I finished out my starting lineup with Carl Amon, who was a recruit from Port Adelaide to Hawthorne this season. I'm hoping that he can at least equal his production for Port Adelaide last year, this year for the Hawks, who have obviously targeted him to play an important role in their team. I just hope that role isn't a more defensive, less fantasy-friendly type of role and more of a role where he gets to run around on the wing or something like that, racking up plenty of cheap posies and kicks. So I took him as a chance to round out my starting lineup. After the Carl Amon pick on this bend, however, my first pick of the bench was also a midfielder because I sort of felt I might want to shore that up a little more just in case a Noah Anderson, a Wines, or an Amon doesn't pan out as much as I hope or falls more than I expect. So I sort of consolidated my midfield a bit more with my first pick of the bench with Sam Berry, who I think is a player that's going to continue to be prioritised more and more in Adelaide get plenty of centre bounce attendances, he's a tackling machine. I think he could potentially go up another level this year, and if he does, he'd be definitely pushing one of those guys out of my starting lineup. In essence, my strategy with my bench as a whole was sort of, because we had quite big benches, eight deep benches, so with my first four members of my bench, I was sort of aiming to have an emergency player for each position, just sort of someone in case I cop an injury or whatever, that I just feel pretty happy relying on if I have to. And if they... As someone I think can build a bit of form, they can potentially push out some of my weaker starters and push them to the emergency position. So it's good to have that high-end depth. I think Adam Saad's pretty self-explanatory in that sense as my emergency defender as well, especially because I have Sam Doherty as well. If something unfortunately does happen with Sam Doherty, I think Adam Saad, uh, fantasy-wise, would be one of the main beneficiaries in terms of production of he had to step up in the event of a Doherty injury or something like that. In terms of the more speculative players I've sort of taken, I think Harry Sheasel and Matthias Philippou are pretty self-explanatory. As I've alluded to a million times, the forward position is the hardest one to find premium talent, and those are the two young fellas coming into the league this year with the most upside to be relevant fantasy forwards. So having both of them on my bench means I have control of both those potentially great assets. As you can sort of see generally as well, I've gone for a lot of dual position players on my bench with that second position as their forward, so I'm taking as many opportunities as possible to dig a diamond out of the rough with the forward position, where if you can land one of those diamonds, they're either a very valuable trade asset or fit round out your starting lineup beautifully. I had a few of the boys in the league actually questioning my pick of Griffin Logue. I, I understand why. He's average shit last year. He's gone to a new team. However, I sort of feel like he does have upside from a fantasy-wise, particularly as a forward, even though he's going to be playing defense this year. When he's allowed to play his preferred role in defense as sort of a more intercepty type forward, he can rack up big fantasy scores when he's allowed to play a bit looser, play a bit more of that James Sicily, Josh Gibson type of role that Alistair Clarkson loves having those sort of guys. I think Griffin Lowe can be a bit of that player and has more fantasy upside than a lot of people suspect, so I wanted to grab him early before he had a good round one and everyone realised that fact. And I can easily drop him if he's a more lockdown key where he isn't given that opportunity to score quite easily and see how some of the other free agent options look before dumping him for one of them. So there's benefits of that extra week or two of analysis on those players as well. Finally, in terms of James Warple and Zohar, I think they're both in line for expanded roles. Warple in particular because of the obvious 
off-season moves of Hawthorne pushing out Tom Mitchell and Jager O'Meara. That means there's a couple of rungs to climb in their midfield hierarchy and Warple's one of those prime players ready to take that. And he sort of showed that a bit in the preseason game, racking up 30 touches and 85 points. So I think he's just another good starting, potential borderline starting midfielder guy that he's worth gambling on, especially compared to the available midfielders and waivers. And the other player, Cam Zerha, even though he's listed purely as a forward, before he got injured in the preseason game, some of their intra clubs, he's been getting quite a few centre bounce attendances, getting thrown in the midfield a bit as that bullish clearance type of player, which I think can elevate his fantasy production up a whole other level. So I basically wanted first dibs on seeing if that eventuates. Overall, with my whole team, I'm quite happy with the way I drafted. I think I have a good, well balanced team where. Where I think my defense on the balance of probabilities will be above average in the league. I think even if solely off Sam Doherty's back, I can have an average backline with the supporting cast I've given him. So that means I'm at least sitting equal there. My midfield's probably dead on average, if not slightly below, mainly because of Brad Crouch scoring some excess points to make up for the other guys being slightly under 100. And hopefully no Anderson can go to an over 100 player to add a bit more balance to Wines and Amon, who may decline, may increase. A bit more variance there with those two. Also, Wits, as I alluded to, is technically about a point below your average starting rock, but for the reasons I alluded to before, because of his consistency, I don't think that really reflects in him as a fantasy asset, and I'm more than happy to have him as my starting rock, even though there's obviously going to be a few guys that outperform him in your English, your Gorn, your Rowan Marshalls. Probably Riley O'Brien's, those sort of dudes. And in terms of our league, other than Joycey, who loaded up his first three picks on forwards, I think I probably have close to the best forward line in our league going into round one, which is the hardest position to have an edge in, so I'm quite happy. I think I've definitely got an above-average forward line in our league, and I think that'll give me something to build on, even if I'm working on the fly a bit to boost my other positions throughout the season with trades and waivers and all that stuff. I think I've given myself a good platform to build off and do all those things as well. So I'm looking forward to getting into the season, I guess. Now, if I may, I'd like to get into my classic team. I'm obviously going to add the disclaimer, but I've recorded recorded this before teams are announced for round one. So some of my rookie guys, I'm probably going to try and switch out for guys who are actually playing as much as I can while I've got the unlimited trades. But on the whole, I think this is going to be the team I take into round one. So I'm going to walk through each position and my rationale behind the guys that I've picked. And then I'll go through my bench as a whole, I think. Obviously, I'm going to start with my defenders because they're sort of at the top of the board. I've, again, similar to my draft, gone with Sam Doherty because all indications seem that he's going to be the premium number one defender this year. And having that as a pillar of my team to build a score off was just too irresistible. And you've got to spend your money on premiums anyway. So why not splurge on the best, I thought. My other premium defenders, I've sort of gone a bit more of the speculative, slightly cheaper path than going a Dawson or a Sinclair type player. I've gone with Hayden Young and Nick Dacos. Both of them averaged in the mid-high 80s last year. But I think both of them have strong potential for a good uptick in their production. Hayden Young showed that in the back of last year as his confidence kept growing and growing off his first healthy season. And Nick Dacos is a first-year player having another preseason under his belt, having other guys come into his team to keep the pressure off him to an extent and let him roam a bit more free in the back line, I think, lends itself to him upticking his production as well rather than having the second-year blues. In terms of my mid-priced option I've gone here, I've gone with Elliot Yo, who at 625000 I think is a great choice because he has starting midfield level upside, even though he's listed as a pure defender. From what I understand, the Eagles are going to let him, by and large, play his role in the midfield that he's accustomed to the last few years when his body's allowed him to. And by all counts, his body's going to hopefully allow him to maintain that production this year. So hopefully... His cash value goes up due to him producing like a midfielder and hopefully his body holds up long enough for me to keep him as a pillar of my team all season rather than cashing in on some of that early appreciation while he's healthy. As for my starting cash cow subject to round one selection, I have gone with Elliot Yo's teammate, Ruben Jimby, high round draft pick who's been given the defender allocation even though he's probably a bit more of a midfielder. 
So I think he's a good player to speculate on. Sounds like he's a good chance to play round one. And Frozy's ready-made body into the contest. So you know he's going to get some of the ball, get some disposal, rack up some fantasy points, and at a minimum, gain you some value. My other starting cash cow defender, Darcy Wilmont, I think is in particular a must-have player in fantasy considering his basement price at $200,000. However, in his three games at AFL level, he has shown the level to produce well above basement. The only reason he's still priced at basement is because those three games happened to be in the finals rather than the regular season, so they weren't weighted towards pricing him for this upcoming season, so that's just some guaranteed value there, I think. Now I'll jump into my midfield, where I can also go for my rationale between my captain and vice-captain. In terms of premium mids, I've chosen to go with Clayton Oliver, Andrew Brayshaw and Jack McRae. This is because I feel these three are the safest to sort of hold their premium value, if not slightly appreciate even, and be consistent 110 plus type pillars for my team. In terms of my leadership group arrangement, I think this could change week to week, subject to matchups, subject to form, that sort of thing. However, when I'm in any sort of doubt, I think my default is going to be a Clayton Oliver captaincy, because he's just had that much sustained form over the past five seasons you just know even a bad week for Clayton Oliver is still going to be a respectable score for a captain that keeps you within range of winning week to week. In terms of my more mid-range speculative midfielders I've gone with a pair of Hawks teammates in Jai Newcomb and James Warple who I think are in prime position to take the positions of Tom Mitchell and Jay Gromira and uptick their production gain some con- gain some cash at a minimum if not becoming consistent borderline premium midfield options for my team throughout the season. The other mid-range player I've gone with in this instance was Chaddy Warner, who I feel similar rationale to Newcomb's established himself enough as a bit of the young guy who's only going to become more and more prioritised in their team as the older guys fade away and they keep elevating and building on each year that they've established. So I think Chaddy Warner, John Newcomb, for that logic, are primed to sort of go up another level. As for my midfield cash cows, I've gone for the easy decision of going with Will Ashcroft. This decision was as easy as shooting fish in a barrel. He averaged 125 in the 18, so even if his production falls off by half, he's still going to be a very profitable cash cow type of player. And if he can get anywhere closer to that, he's a borderline pillar for your team. If not a super cash cow that allows you to build up that excess to buy a premium player. Basically by this logic, like I said, even if his production halves from the under-18s, as my year 12 economics teacher DJ Steve said, Will Ashcroft is money for jam. My other choice as a cash cow mid is Will Phillips for similar rationale to Ashcroft. However, he's had more time in the system, less proven production. However, I think his extra time in the system and the new opportunity with a new coach, new priorities, I think Will Phillips is another person primed to produce enough to at least make you some profit if not potentially assert himself in that North Melbourne midfield as for my rucks for the millionth time Jared Witz is consistent Woo! yeah but yeah I think he's a consistent player I can just set and forget for the season which is invaluable in a way in fantasy classic because unexpected trades can sort of kill your flow all sorts of things like that so someone you can just set and forget barring injury Provides a fair bit of value, I think. My second ruck, however, I'm freely going to admit, is filled entirely by my Dockers bias, and that is former Dockers ruckman Lloyd Meek. I think Lloyd Meek is finally in a place where the path to a number one ruckman position is quite clear for someone of his talents. I think he's going to take that opportunity by both hands and walk into round one as the Hawks' number one ruck option. And as someone... Mid-priced, I think there is upside for him if he gets a consistent opportunity as a number one ruck to build on that cash value a little bit. If not establish himself as a average ruck, if not slightly above average ruck, if everything can go to plan for him. This Lloyd Meek selection also leads me into a point that I think everyone should sort of consider when they're trying to build their own fantasy classic team, and that is having a few points of difference. These points of difference are quite important, I think, because by the time we're a few weeks into the season, a lot of people's teams start to look very similar because everyone knows who the cash cows that are going to appreciate are going to be. Everyone sort of starts moving on to the premium players they think are going to be the guys that are going to be there the whole season. 
So a few weeks into the season, by the time people have got to do a few trades, a lot of teams look very similar. And the thing is, when a lot of teams start to look very similar, that increases your reliance on those players that you have that are different than your opponent, different than your opponents if you're in sort of a just general more scoring league. But having those points of difference means rather than you just equaling your opponent's production in a given position, you have the potential to pip them at the post or whatever rather than the assured draw of having the same person that they have. Because obviously if you both have the same player, it's just going to be a wash. It's a guaranteed draw, except of course if you're fiddling with captaincies and you have different captains, that sort of thing. But barring that, you do definitely want to have some different players than the conventional everyone goes must have type of players. You want that point of difference so you have the opportunity to win rather than draw because I assume everyone's playing for the win rather than to just not suck. Last but certainly not least is my forward line. As you can see where I've gone quite heavily with the premium slash semi-premium forwards. On the premium end I've gone with Tim Taranto who I think is a borderline Brownlow medal contender. Definitely a smoky for the Brownlow. He's going to become a midfield bull for the Richmond Tigers. Get plenty of opportunity to become an absolute fantasy pig. Fairly confident he should average over 100. And I think he's a good pillar to have as a consistent cog in my forward line. Whereas for my two other high-end, little more speculative players, I've gone with Connor Rosie and Errol Golden. Connor Rosie, I sort of feel fairly confidently that he's going to join the 100-plus club this year, getting consistent opportunities in Port Adelaide's midfield. He showed it in the back half of the season when he was given those opportunities and he's only going to build on that and continue becoming the man in Port Adelaide. So I think he's a near essential to have in your forward line because it's so hard to find those 100-plus forwards where if you can pay the price for basically an 88 averaging forward who's going to average 100, you have to take those opportunities and run. Similar logic with Golden, even though on the balance of probabilities he's less likely than Rosie to reach those peaks. However, he is someone with the upside to reach those peaks, so it's worth speculating on. And even if he can only maintain, slightly build on his average or even slightly regress, it's not going to be a big gain or loss either way, and he still holds a good chunk of value to move him into something more consistent. My speculative forwards is also quite self-explanatory. Harry Sheasel, Matthias Philippou, as I've touched on, are the two rookie forwards who are most likely to be fantasy relevant this year. So I'm happy to have them both in my starting lineup. I think they're both probably going to play round one, so hopefully can start at a minimum generating some extra cash for me as early as possible. As for my other speculative forward, I was sort of juggling a few options. Josh Sin, Luke Pedler, who's on my bench some other players but in the end I've decided to go with Bailey Humphrey a young fellow Gold Coast I've invested in reasonably heavily he's going to be playing a bit of forward for them this year and hopefully playing round one and someone at a minimum again I can make a bit of money off to reinvest in my team something else I'll touch on before getting into my bench is sort of this idea of hedging players I think is probably a good way of putting it Basically, you sort of get a couple of options that you think have the upside to improve their fantasy production. And basically, the idea of hedging is you take two guys that you think have that sort of upside, keeping the one who does pan out and reevaluating and either flipping or being happy with the other guy if he's sort of equaled his production or whatever. But you hedge, you take like two guys from the same team that both are primed for a big role. I've in my team's case, I've done this in a couple of instances with Chad Warner and Errol Golden from the Swans and Jai Newcomb and James Warple from the Hawks. As I alluded to, I know all four players are primed for bigger roles, but sort of on the balance of probabilities, on the reality of the way these things pan out, probably only one from each pair is really going to be the guy that elevates, whereas the other guy either is going to sustain, be a bit of a sacrificial lamb, or maybe grow a little bit. I think it's worth coming into these hedges with an open mind between the sort of players you're dealing with like because in a lot of cases it isn't a linear the potential for increase 100% of it goes to one guy zero goes to another guy there's all sorts of different splits between that they might split it 50 50 that increase in production in which case you've hit on two guys reasonably well rather than hit on one guy spectacularly and another guy not so much you probably hope for that 50 50 so you're getting good value out of two slots rather than one but with the head, you sort of know you're going to keep one as a pillar for your team as the rest of the year and the other player is someone you might flip 
even if it is the guy that exceeds expectations more, gets that extra cash, you feel like you can flip him. The other guy's still a consistent pillar, but you can turn the other guy into something even better and more consistent. It just gives you options as long as you're sort of cognizant of the hedge and how you want to play it. At the present stage, my bench is pretty fluid. I'm sort of probably going to take the opportunity while I still have unlimited trades to flip as many of these guys for basement guys that are going to be playing round one. However, you know that's not always the case, and some of these guys are probably worth sitting on even if they don't play round one. One guy I do like in particular is basement price, Campbell Chesser, especially because he's a defender. It sounds like he's possibly going to play a bit of wing, maybe a bit of defense as well for the Eagles. He's a young fellow they invested the first round pick in last year, so I think they're keen to get games into him. And at basement price, there's limitless upside for him to at least make you some money. In my midfield, in particular, McKenzie, he is a very interesting player. He's already gotten some opportunities to play some inside mid for them in the preseason. You don't know how much he's going to be prioritized once the actual games are happening. But regardless, he feels like someone who's going to play round one, going to make you a bit of money especially if he's sitting on your bench. Although it's quite likely I push him into my starting lineup in the event of Phillips or another player I have isn't playing round one. I also like Shannon Neal. I think these younger guys, they take a bit of time. They've given him a couple of opportunities, but with another full preseason, he might get to assert himself. He also has a bit of potential to play some ruck, so he might get the dual position ruck, as well as producing like a ruck rather than a forward, where you get a few extra points out of him. But yeah, other than that, I've maintaining my bench pretty fluidly i'm just gonna sort of try and get as many guys i can make some cash in as possible depending on who's playing when while i have unlimited trades because once your trades are limited you sort of got two picks each week where you got to prioritize what you want to do to maximize your team and that's a bit more of a decision process where you, whereas now you can be a bit more flippant well that's how i summed up my classic and fantasy draft teams this year i hope everyone enjoyed the video I think I'll probably review some of the things I've said in a few weeks' time, make another video, see how right or wrong I am, see which guys have panned out, which guys have whiffed, have a bit of discussion around all that. But good video. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.